Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. I'm the head of strategy innovation for the Center for Functional Medicine. I'm really glad to be here this morning, or maybe this afternoon, <laughs> depending on what time zone you're in, to uh, the Center for Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, and today, we're honored to have, again, uh, a distinguished guest, Terry Walls, who's a clin cl clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa. She conducts clinical trials looking at the therapeutic effect of diet and lifestyle on multiple sclerosis and related symptoms. Um, and she's done a number of research studies that help to show the power of this intervention uh, in this very difficult and complicated condition. Uh, Walls has also been a patient who's had secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, which confined her to a wheelchair and uh, actually a tilt reclining wheelchair for four years. Uh, and she was able to restore health using diet and lifestyle and functional medicine uh, that was designed to uh, affect her nervous system in her brain and address the autoimmunity and now pedals her bike miles every day to work. <laughs> She's the author of The Walls Protocol, How to Be Progressive MS Using Paleo Principles in Functional Medicine and The Walls Protocol, a Radical New Way to Treat All Chronic Autoimmune Conditions Using Paleo Principles and a Companion Cookbook. Uh, she travels the world, not any, probably not anymore, but <laughs> via Zoom, uh, talking about the healing power of diet and lifestyle for those with chronic illnesses. And I'm very pleased to have her here for our grand rounds to talk about the power of food as medicine in treating conditions which we often don't think are necessarily related to food or diet, such as autoimmune disease, and particularly MS. So welcome, Dr. Walls, and I hope you all enjoy this presentation. And after, we'll have time for some Q&A, which I'll moderate at the end of the lecture. 20 years ago, out walking with my wife, my left leg grows weak, dragging it. I hobble home. At night, in bed next to Jack, I think about my zingers, the jolts of electrical face pain that have grown relentlessly worse for 20 years. Not wanting to be a burden, I secretly pray what I have is fatal. It takes only three years. I take the mitosantrin infusions, I get the tilt recline wheelchair. I try Tizabri, then Celsa, but nothing helps. I am too weak to sit up at my desk, so I order a zero gravity chair that lets me recline back with my knees higher than my nose. And I let go of the future. Instead, I take each day as it unfolds. Ugh. My zingers are on. My 10 year old daughter hugs me, triggering more pain. But I'm a physician. Night after night, I go to PubMed to review the basic science studies of MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and I begin experimenting on myself. The speed of my decline slows. And then I discover a study of electrical stimulation of muscles. And I ask my physical therapist, can I try that? It's called E-STEM. My test session hurts bad, but when it's over, I feel great. And I begin doing E-STEM to as much pain as I can tolerate. Now, I know my physicians say there's nothing I can do to recover, but is there more that I could do to slow my decline? I add daily meditation. I redesign my paleo diet based on all that science I've been reading. One month later, I, I'm sitting up at my desk. Three months later, those zingers, those horrible zingers of 27 years are gone. And five months later, I walk without even a cane. And then six months later, and it's been six years with, with my son, Zach, Jogging on the left, my daughter Zeb on the right, I get back on my bike. It wobbles, but I, I catch my balance and I am biking and my family is crying tears of joy. And that transforms how I think about disease and health. It transforms the way I practice medicine and it transforms the focus of my research. 10 years later, I received the Linus Pauling Award from the Institute for Functional Medicine for my groundbreaking clinical research and patient care protocol. And now the dietary approaches to treating multiple sclerosis is the focus of my research. So here are my disclosures. 
I have grant funding from the MS Society, which we've just completed. I've trademarked the Wall's diet plans, uh, the Wall's protocol. I have the books that uh, Mark so graciously uh, mentioned. I receive uh, royalty payments from Penguin Random House. I've been paid to speak. I have equity interest in those companies, and I own the website, TerryWalls.com, where I, I teach the public and clinicians more about uh, diet uh, and lifestyle. Now, the objectives by the end of the presentation, um, you guys should be able to decide the dietary plans that have demonstrated effectiveness at reducing the number of enhancing lesions uh, in MRI and disability and that have been proven in MS clinical trials and describe which dietary plans have favorable pilot data in MS clinical trials for patient reported outcomes and really important uh, medical comorbidities. And then we'll talk about the key dietary elements that I recommend uh, in the wellness plans for autoimmune patients. My story, I've already told you guys that. We're gonna hit on the MS dietary research uh, and I'll give much more detail about research from our lab and the rationale for the dietary plans that we use. And then I'll give you some recommendations for the MS patients. Now, um, I have, uh, prior to medical school, I competed nationally in full contact uh, Taekwondo. Uh, in fact, uh, the Pan American Trials in 1978, went off uh, to be a physician, had a couple kids, and then in 2000 uh, is when I became patient. I had uh, leg weakness, had a history of visual dimming, lesions in my spinal cord, abnormal spinal fluid, and the diagnosis of MS. Now, this usually begins as optic neuritis or clinically isolated syndrome, and half of those folks will go on to MS. 10% may have benign course, 10% have primary, a, a relentless decline, or 80% have relapsing remitting MS, which is uh, what I was diagnosed with. It's an expensive disease. That's about uh, 50,000 to 75,000 a year. That was in 2013. That expense has uh, increased uh, with the onset of all the biologics. On top of that, you have the MRI, the labs, the therapy, the office visits, and within 10 years of diagnosis, although now that's probably moved to 15 because of the biologic, one half will exit the workforce due to fatigue disability, a, uh, a third will have gait disability, and again, most will convert to the progressive forms of the illness, secondary progressive or progressive relapse. Uh, for the individual and their family, you're going to have the lost income for the person with MS. It's the leading cause of early disability here in the U.S. You'll have the caregiving cost uh, if that's from strangers. Uh, family income loss if they're doing the caregiving. And it is a here in the U.S. and um, lengthy uh, and early nursing home care. Now, back in 2000, the treatment options were the interferons uh, and copaxone, which was a decoy protein. And once you got to the progressive forms, that was resistant to the interferons, in which case you were given mitoxantrone. Uh, and if you had primary progressive MS, uh, there was no treatment. So my, my timeline, interestingly enough, I was introduced to uh, uh, the work of Lauren Cordain uh, and direct MS, a charity out of uh, Canada. At that point, after 20 years of being a vegetarian, I adopted the paleo diet, gave up all grains, all legumes, all dairy, uh, and I hit the wheelchair anyway. Uh, so within three years, I'm in that sort of Klein wheelchair. I'd also completed the uh, North American Research Committee on MS Quality of Life Survey, uh, and I've been doing that since 2003. And every uh, six months, I would complete these surveys my MS symptoms were always worse, and my fatigue, which had been mild uh, when I was uh, first started completing this, had become total, uh, impacting every aspect of my life. There is that zero gravity chair that I mentioned, and in 2007, I discovered electrical stimulation of muscles, and I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. And here again, the big timeline: symptoms began during medical school. 
I had uh, polymyopic neuritis in 87. Uh, then in 2000, I'm diagnosed uh, and I start Copaxone. I switched to the uh, vegetarian. I switched to the paleo diet after having been a vegetarian for 20 years. I, I convert to progressive MS. I started on Novantrone. Uh, I, I start reading the basic science. I add a lot of uh, supplements. I uh, tried Tizabri and then Celsep. Uh, it really doesn't do anything. 2007, I discover E-STEM. Uh, I uh, discover IFM. Uh, and then at the very end of 07, I reorganize and restructure my paleo diet. So these two photographs are a year apart. So that, this really has this dramatic impact on my understanding of disease and health. Now I'm going to flip over and do a review of what the research says about diet and dietary interventions for MS. This is from Bruce Ames who identifies key mitochondrial nutrients and has the theory that low micronutrient intake accelerates the degenerative aging uh, via uh, early senescence of the mitochondria. He focuses on zinc, magnesium, biotin, vitamins K, D, and A. And uh, he also talks about lipoic acid, acetylcarnitine. And in the animal models, uh, these nutrients have been uh, really quite helpful. Now, in observational studies, uh, we see that patients consistently do not meet governmental guidelines for vegetable and fruit intake, uh, and that 80% consume less than three servings of vegetables a day, which, by the way, matches what the average American uh, is consuming. And again, uh, in, a, in a large study of about 2,500 folks with confirmed MS, uh, uh, 2,000 provided enough data to get a dietary habits, so again, a diet quality score. And what they saw was as you improve diet quality, you had improved physical health uh, quality of life, mental health quality of life, and less uh, probability of uh, higher disability scores. So we have a lot of uh, evidence suggesting that diet quality matters. Uh, now we're gonna flip over to another index, which I think is really interesting, the Dietary Inf Inflammation Index. And this was created uh, in uh, 2010. So they looked at articles that were scored according to whether they increased, decreased, or had no effect on a number of key inflammatory biomarkers. IL-1B, IL-4, IL-6, IL-10, TNF-alpha, and C-reactive protein. So these are inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory uh, biomarkers. They looked at uh, over 6,000 articles that were screened. They used uh, just under 2,000 articles to create the index. And when they fit it to their global database, the index ranges between a a pro-inflammatory state of plus 7.98 or an anti-inflammatory state of minus 8.87. It does not provide a definition of what food groups specifically are the optimal anti-inflammation diet. They do have 45 food uh, parameters that they identify, and I'm going to run through those. <clears throat> so the macronutrients, uh, protein, carbs, fat, uh, total calories. Iron, magnesium, selenium, zinc, and then uh, uh, vitamins A, the B vitamins C, D, and E, and fat, cholesterol, saturated fat, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and specifically omega-3, omega-6, and then trans fat, which is a negative nutrient, so that's uh, uh, pro-inflammatory, uh, beta-carotene, Flavanol, flavones, flavanol, uh, flavanones, acanthocyanidins, isoflavones, isoganol. So very important uh, polyphenols. Uh, a whole slew of spices, and then uh, some beverages. So this has been used in over two hundred different observational studies. Again, negative point seven is the most anti-inflammatory diet, and many dietary patterns have. Uh, been found to have these anti-inflammatory features. Mediterranean, 
the MIND diet, paleo diet, uh, Wall's diet. And then the most inflammatory diet are those diets high in added sugar and processed foods. And those are westernized diets. The DAII score correlates very strongly with the risk of obesity, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, respiratory health, so asthma and chronic lung disease, musculoskeletal health, so that includes rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, osteopenia, osteoporosis, maternal health, including uh, preterm uh, labor, intergenerational health, so mom's health, and the uh, outcome uh, of the infants in neural developmental disorders uh, and cancers. And these are really important comorbidities in the autoimmune patient. And I want to have you take a step back. Remember, humans, we uh, developed in uh, equatorial Africa. We gradually migrated across Africa into the Mideast, into Europe, Asia, Australia, the Pacific Islands, North America, and then South America. So we've, we have had reproductive success in diverse uh, ecosystems and diverse dietary patterns. So it makes sense that in fact, these anti-inflammatory uh, diets scores are, have many dietary patterns that may have a uh, optimal anti-inflammatory effect. So what we need to do are dietary intervention studies. But the problem is they're really hard to do. If we're gonna ask people to give up familiar foods that are yummy, that they know how to cook and shop for, and eat new foods with unfamiliar tastes, new recipes, new menus, and new shopping requirements. And they're gonna crave foods that we've now told them to avoid. And now many people have either never learned how to cook, menu plan, shop, or may uh, have forgotten how to do that. Plus they're going to have social family peer work pressures to eat those excluded foods. This makes recruitment and retention into a dietary intervention study hard. And once you get people in, I can assure you, nobody wants to be in the control arm because if they're willing to do the work to be in a dietary intervention study, they said, okay, I'll change about what I eat. They are not gonna be happy to find that you don't want them to change what they eat. And they will, the control arm often begins to eat what you said the intervention arm was going to eat. So these, these are hard things to do. I'm gonna walk you through the studies that we do have that prospectively have looked at diet. Swank was the original guy, a neurologist, uh, who made uh, as part of the observation uh, that during World War II, when there was less fat in the diet, people had a lower rate of new diagnoses and those who had MS had a slower disease course. So we began recommending a low saturated fat diet, 15 grams of saturated fat to his uh, patients and followed them. So the original cohort he described was 265 folks, but there was a high attrition rate and it was probably not random. His final end that he reported on was 144. It was not blinded. So they're abstracting their clinical records. And again, they found, compared less than 15 grams sat fat to more than 15 grams and followed them to 50 years to death or loss to follow up and found that the greatest benefit occurred earlier in the disease course. They were more likely to remain inhibitory and there was reduced all cause mortality. Next big interesting study, uh, McDougall diet, low fat vegan, uh, basically it's a low fat vegan version of the Swank diet. It's randomized, blinded assessors, weightless control, uh, we got 61 folks that went all the way through. Control diet versus McDougal diet. You went to a 10-day intensive immersion with other folks going through a McDougal diet uh, immersion. Uh, and it was a live-in, so you uh, were trained how to eat, shop. And then they followed them for one year. There was no change between the diet and control baseline uh, at the end of the study. For MRI or enhancing lesions and volumes, although the trend favored uh, the intervention group. So if you had 250 folks in the study, as you would a drug study, 
uh, they would have had a, enough power. There was no difference in the in the EDSS score, that's the disability score. But again, the changes favored the intervention. And you would have had about 230 uh, to show difference, which would be typical of the size that the drug intervention studies will have. They did improve lipids. Total cholesterol went down. Uh, LDL was down. And then that's the intervention versus the control group. Insulin uh, was better. Reduced fatigue. The p-value for the average monthly change. Uh, the modified fatigue uh, impact scale. Uh, and that would, I normalized it to a year. They went down to 4.9 versus 0.78. And the clinically significant difference for modified fatigue impact scale, by the way, is four. So they, it was uh, statistically significant, but clinically not significant. Fatigue severity went down 2.37 uh, versus 0.3. The clinically significant number there was 0.45, so that would have been clinically significant. Milk might be a problem for people with MS. Uh, we have multiple observational studies showing that dairy consumption is associated with a higher rate of MS uh, and uh, a higher uh, higher rate of more severe symptoms. Uh, and part of the mechanism may be that if you have an abnormal immune response to gluten because of the cross reactivity, you may also have an abnormal immune response uh, to casein. And we know that celiac patients have a higher rate of neurological symptoms and enhancing lesions on MRI that will resolve with a meticulous uh, uh, negative uh, or gluten exclusion uh, diet. And again, case report, case series, linking reversible uh, neural symptoms uh, to enhancing lesions. However, when we look at tissue grant transglutaminase, antiglutin antibodies, and celiac rates in MS population studies, these results are not consistent. So <clears throat> gluten is a factor for some, but probably not everyone. We do have a study that looked prospectively at a gluten-free diet. 72 folks were followed for four and a half years. It's not randomized, uh, did not have blinded sires. Uh, so the risk of bias is high. The RD trained them on the study diet, and then at three months assessed their adherence. And they had 36 folks who were, who were assessed as adherent at three months and 36 who were not adherent. There were fewer enhancing lesions on MRI in the adherent group versus the non-adherent group. And there was less disability in the adherent group. The relapse rate, however, was not different. Calorie restriction. So this small study, very short time period. 36, eight weeks. And they were just looking for safety. Uh, there were three diets, uh, a 22% reduction in daily needs versus a 75% reduction two days a week versus zero reduction. And of course, you have hunger and weight loss in the um, both calorie-restricted groups compared to the control. A post hoc analysis of patient-reported outcomes said that the functional assessment of MS uh, was not different between the groups. However, it had the emotional well-being uh, subscale uh, was uh, improved for the calorie-restricted group. Mediterranean diet, case control study, 70 with relapse remitting, 140 age and gender match controls. There was a diet interview uh, by the dietitian, and they did an odds ratio for MS. Univariate, multivariate analyses uh, were adjusted. So a higher consumption decreased the risk for fruits and vegetables. So uh, lower odds ratio. A higher consumption increased the risk for refined grain. However, the p-value was not significant. And not significant either way were nuts, legumes, fish, unsaturated fat, high fat, dairy, red meat, or white meat. Now we have a prospective study, 36 randomized one year. They modified, uh, so it's legumes, vegetables, nuts, fish, olive oil, avocados. And then they said, avoid added sugar, 
meat, dairy, white grains, and processed sugar. And they got monthly support calls with a 90% adherence to the intervention at self-report. They had reduced fatigue with the neurological fatigue index, uh, so it went down 4.6, and the clinical significance there would be 2.5, so that's clinically significant. They had improved function. The, the disability status score went down 0.98. Uh, not quite to clinical significance, but that's still uh, quite impressive. Uh, and they did not have uh, MRIs. Uh, again, their uh, Mediterranean diet, olive oil, salad of vegetables, whole grains, mostly uh, rice, relatively low in red meat. Ketogenic diet, single arm study. Again, very small study, six months. They did a modified Atkins diet, reduced A1C glucose insulin, reduced BMI, uh, uh, reduced central obesity. And they had a remarkable reduction in a modified fatigue impact scale, uh, a BD, BDI score, that's spec depression uh, index scores, a transient increase in total cholesterol and triglycerides, and the disability SCADA score improved due to bowel and bladder function. They also uh, uh, checked uh, MRIs, and there were no enhancing lesions. Um, we don't uh, there was no control, so we can't really say if this was protective or not. But at least it was not indicative of uh, causing enhancing or being associated with enhancing lesions. Now we have a fasting weekend diet and a ketogenic diet. Uh, 60 folks for six months, randomized, three diets. The fasting weekend diet, so you're, it's really an intermittent calorie restriction. They had 300 calories for seven days, uh, followed by a Mediterranean diet. And so these folks are going to be really quite hungry by the time they get to those uh, seven days. And then a standard Mediterranean diet. Or a ketogenic diet, 150 grams of fat, uh, 50 grams of carbs, and 100 grams of protein. So it's a, a fair amount of uh, carbs. We don't have uh, indications in terms of how they followed ketones. Uh, and then the usual diet. And here we have both the fasting weekend diet and the keto diet improves quality of life uh, in the uh, mental health and uh, physical health subscales, five to 12 points uh, relative control. Uh, and the clinical significance uh, is five uh, and no p-value was uh, given in that data. So I'll tell you about the stuff that we're doing. We started out with a safety and feasibility study, a single arm, uh, which uh, basically used the same interventions that I used, uh, and we'll go through that. So single arm, safety and feasibility, we had blinded assessors, and the questions were, could other people do what I did? Uh, was it safe? Uh, so uh, was I causing harm to anyone? And what was the effect on fatigue, quality of life, motor function, mood, cognition, and lipids. So we asked people to stop processed foods, gluten, dairy, and eggs. Eat three cups of greens, three cups of color, three cups of sulfur uh, in the cabbage, onion, mushroom family. And that was for very specific nutrients that I had identified based on all that reading I, I was doing that were important, either uh, expert studies or animal model studies uh, for uh, neural function. We also suggested liver once a week, and if they could afford it, grass-fed meat and wild fish according to what their budget would allow. And we encouraged fermented food, uh, seaweed, uh, nutritional yeast, uh, and algae. And so this is a typical meal, lots of salads, uh, smoothies. Uh, those are lamb chops, cooked greens, Brussels sprouts. Because I was excluding you know, food groups, I needed to do a uh, dietary uh, assessment to ensure safety. And so we analyzed my diet uh, with a, a three-day, 24-hour recall. Uh, and the dietitian who did that analysis said this was the most nutrient-dense diet that she'd ever analyzed. Uh, so anyway, we got permission to go ahead uh, and do our study. We had targeted supplements. 
uh, and really focused on methyl B12, methylfolate, vitamin D, and fish oil. Again, uh, more vegetable, uh, liver once a week, we meditation, we taught them exercise, and we taught them how to use stimulation to support uh, exercise. So the big risk was uh, if you were overweight or obese, you lost back to the weight that you were at, typically 20s. And I had to um, make reports to my IRB every three months because people so lost and were notifying the primary care docs. Uh, one was at six months due to cognitive decline. Uh, the adherence to interventions uh, on the left, you see that people quickly change their diet. Uh, and the high intake, uh, about five servings of gluten, dairy, and eggs, and one and a half servings of vegetables, actually matches pretty closely to American diet. They essentially eliminated, eliminated the excluded food uh, and got up to eight servings. If you go to a public health uh, meeting, that level of change in diet quality would be astonishing. If you, it can increase the mean intake of uh, vegetables by one serving a day at the end of a year in the public health world, that would be a home run. On the right is the amount of e-stim and exercise that people are doing, uh, and that's the uh, minutes per day. Keep in mind, the people in our study with progressive MS were exhausted. It's, we got constantly exercise every day. Uh, and that they consistently also did e-stim. Uh, and so they would do e-stim to get supplemental exercise uh, of their muscles beyond what they're doing volitionally. The uh, top two lines are the improvements uh, in the quality of life uh, uh, in terms of general, uh, general energy uh, and general quality of life. The bottom lines are severity. So remember the clinical quality uh, qual of life, uh, that uh, five point uh, is clinically meaningful. So that ends up being about 16 points on that graph. Uh, and the fatigue reduction is uh, 2.5. Uh, and so you can see large clinically significant uh, changes. Uh, and the p-values were uh, less than 0 0.005. And this is just another graph showing you the sharp reduction in fatigue uh, that occurs over time. Uh, people get sometimes get a little concerned, you know, does eating liver uh, and eating meat uh, increase uh, the total cholesterol and HDL? Uh, so these graphs show you that the BMI drops, total cholesterol drops, uh, HDL actually in, uh, increases, and so that's the protective cholesterol. And then the uh, triglycerides drop, uh, and the uh, triglyceride HDL ratio uh, also drops, uh, indicating that insulin sensitivity likely improved. We did not uh, measure insulin. Uh, we also looked at anxiety and depression scores. Those are the Beck Anxiety and Depression Index. Uh, that dropped significantly as well. Uh, and we also have the um, verbal and nonverbal reasoning. Uh, that uh, increases, and I apologize, I do not have the clinical significance uh, numbers for those. I want you to keep in mind that with progressive MS, you anticipate a 10 to 15% uh, decline uh, every year once that domain has been impacted. And so uh, it really is quite remarkable that we have cognition is improving on top of, in a scenario where we expect there would have been a uh, decline. Now, these are the associations between adherence. Uh, and, and so if you adhered, uh, to eating the recommended food or avoiding the wrong food, um, you had better fatigue change, uh, verbal reasoning, uh, and mood change. 
So again, I've just sort of summarized our findings here. Um, so better fatigue, better quality of life, better reasoning, better moods, better BMI, and better lipids. Now we saw that uh, there's less, you, you did better uh, if you had less disability at baseline, a shorter disease duration, you were able to do a larger intervention, that is the family did the diet with you, or that you were able to do more of the exercise in E-STEM. Next, we did a uh, randomized control trial, single blind weightless control, again, blinded assessors, modified paleo versus usual diet, uh, and the MS quality of life, physical health, mental health went up 10 to 14 points relative uh, to the control, uh, uh, a positive p-value less than uh, 0.03. Fatigue severity score went down 1.4, uh, p-value uh, 0.03. Again, the clinical significance uh, is 0.45. Uh, and there's uh, that data for you. Then we did a modified paleo and an MCT ketogenic diet, uh, uh, randomized uh, small numbers. And part, part of what I uh, want to acknowledge is what I discovered is if you have a usual care control, uh, recruiting is much, much harder. Uh, so we did modified paleo versus ketogenic versus usual diet. The keto group, uh, we got into ketosis. We reduced the glucose, glucose, reduced insulin. The paleo group had less fatigue, uh, better quality of life, and that was better than keto or control. However, it was not statistically different between the ketogenic uh, and the paleo group. Again, very, very small sample size. Uh, then we uh, had this big study funded by the MS Society, which we've just completed. Uh, it's the Walls Elimination Diet versus the Swank Diet. Uh, so we have all those uh, fruits and vegetables, gluten-free, dairy-free. Uh, we take out uh, all grains and nightshades. After 12 weeks, we reintroduce gluten-free grains uh, and legumes and nightshades one at a time to, be, to identify what foods people are intolerant of. Uh, and the low sat swank diet, we reduce uh, sat fat to less than 15 grams a day and encourage uh, four servings of whole grain a day. So it's a parallel group. It's the biggest study to date. Um, and the biggest measures we're looking at are modified fatigue impact scale and fatigue severity scale. Those were primary outcomes. We also looked at uh, quality of life, uh, mental health scales, six-minute walk test in terms of meters walked. Um, I, and I should go back. So we've written that up. It's been submitted to a high-impact uh, journal. We're very excited. Um, it's under review. Hopefully, uh, that will uh, get published and in print uh, yet this year. Uh, the study we're doing right now is uh, basically uh, the Wallace Protocol, You know what, what I did, uh, diet, uh, lifestyle, uh, uh, so diet, uh, and it, without drugs versus standard of care, uh, people can choose which inner arm they're in. Uh, it's virtual visits only, uh, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, we can enroll people who are within one year of diagnosis with either relapse remitting MS or clinically isolated syndrome. The control arm is getting usual care treated by the neurologist with MS expertise, and we are still recruiting for that arm. The intervention arm has been offered and declined DMTs. We've already filled that arm up, uh, and they're getting the walls elimination diet. We're teaching them meditation and giving them a walking program, and that's our uh, uh, clinical trials uh, indicator. You can uh, reach out to us at msdietstudy at healthcare.uiowa.edu. Uh, and we have a handout that has links to that, so you guys could sign up for that. Now, the reality is changing dietary patterns is incredibly hard. That food is so yummy, it's so pervasive, it is so everywhere, and eating that food stimulates the pleasure centers of our brain. Our patients crave that stuff, and it is a really task have them give up the sugar, give up the processed foods. Uh, or if we put them on the saturated, low sat fat diet, to have them give up uh, the fat. 
So one of the things that we do is we spend a lot of time asking people why they want to make this change. Uh, and a great question, uh, uh, we ask them, is there someone or something you care so deeply about that you would run into a brain building to go save? So in my case, it was my kids. Um, but this is a, a really key part of what we need to do uh, to help our patients be much more successful, uh, to tap into why. And then we have to acknowledge that it is difficult. They will experience cravings uh, and help them plan uh, how they're going to make their eating environment safer for them so they can have fewer temptations. So the summary that I want all of you to take home is no diet has been shown to be effective at reducing the number of enhancing lesions, number of relapses, or disability status. And that's because uh, we have limited data, small studies, short duration, and very few studies have looked at MRIs. However, I have shown you a bunch of data that we have a lot of dietary patterns that will likely be very beneficial for the comorbid problems that your MS patients will experience. Um, and that, you know, a, a, a anti-inflammation diet is likely going to be beneficial for the comorbid problems. In addition, we do have some preliminary data that we have dietary plans, again, in small pilot studies that have improved MS symptoms or quality of life markers or biomarkers for important comorbid conditions, such as glucose sensitivity, uh, lipids, uh, blood pressure, body mass index. So again, dietary patterns with pilot data that's you know encouraging. Low-fat diet, so that's Swank and McDougall. The modified paleo diet, so that's the Wallace diet, Wallace elimination. Calorie restriction. Now, the downside of calorie restriction is asking people to do a 22% uh, calorie restriction the rest of their life means you're asking them to be hungry for the rest of their life. That will be a very difficult thing to do long term. Intermittent fasting, 75% reduction of calories two days a week. Again, uh, that may be challenging. Frankly, I think time restricted feeding is probably easier, although we don't have studies specific to MS on that. Ketogenic diet, um, we have uh, some preliminary data. If you're doing ketogenic diets, clearly you need to be following lipids. Uh, to see what's going on there. And the fasting making diet, so that's really a calorie restricted diet on an intermittent basis. And the Mediterranean diet uh, and gluten free diet. So, my challenge for all of you is find patients that this could work with, people who are interested in doing diet and lifestyle. Uh, talk to your patients that diet quality is going to be really important for the comorbid issues of uh, at risk for diabetes, uh, prediabetes, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure. Work collaboratively with the patient family uh, to find a dietary plan that they could live with. Because you have many plans I've just gone through with you that are, are beneficial. And if the family commits to this as a family, they'll be much more successful. If you have the patient eat one way and the family eat the other way, you're asking, it's like asking an alcoholic to stop alcohol while you have cold beer in the refrigerator. It's going to uh, be a huge struggle. At the very basic, we could talk about more vegetables, less added sugar, and less flour-based products uh, because they're um, high glycemic index. If the person's open to it, I, I would talk about a gluten-free diet, dairy-free diet, elimination diet, or food sensitivity testing to see could they be, have unrecognized food sensitivity. Now, the Walls versus Swank diet is the largest dietary intervention study to date, and it has the strongest evidence to date. Not published yet, so stay tuned. Uh, we're very hopeful it'll be out uh, this year. And now let's see if I can.
again, um, it, here at this patient stands, uh, she has uh, her difficulty lifting her toes. You'll see that her toes will be uh, dragging across uh, the carpet. Uh, she's so unstable, we're chasing her with the chair. Uh, her fatigue severity, uh, I believe, is uh, 5.6 uh, at baseline. Uh, again, her toe is stuck. We're going to help her uh, move her foot uh, forward here in just a moment. Uh, okay. So that's her baseline. Uh, and then at uh, three months, she stands much more, this is at nine months. You can see how much more fluidly uh, her uh, leg is uh, swinging forward. So she's done uh, really quite well. This is subject 11. Uh, her fatigue was uh, 5.7 at baseline. At just three months, she now is in Birkenstocks. And you'll see that at six months, she's able to jog. And subject uh, 14 uh, requires two walking sticks. He's quite spastic and quite stiff. At nine months, he's much more fluid. And here he is uh, without walking sticks. Subject 17 has primary progressive MS, uh, quite stiff, needing two walking sticks at just three months. We're down to one walking stick, uh, much less stiff. And her fatigue, by the way, remarkably reduced. Uh, and uh, walking uh, now faster without uh, any canes. So uh, again, we're recruiting newly diagnosed MS patients uh, in clinically isolated syndrome for the standard of care arm. You can reach my uh, study team at ms.study at healthcare.uiowa.edu. If you'd like to get a copy of the protocol that I use that has all of our wellness uh, tips, uh, go to terrywalls.com forward slash Cleveland. If you want uh, copies of my papers uh, and the video, that's at terrywalls.com forward slash papers. And with that, I will, if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen, I will stop and I can answer your questions. Well, thank you, Terry. That was a very enlightening presentation. It sort of underscores the principle that I think continue to emerge that food is medicine. And I'm, I'm actually very excited to see the work you're doing that forward that uh, approach to treating chronic disease. Uh, good news is that uh, there's a bill currently in Congress uh, to advance uh, medically tailored meals for chronic illness and use food as medicine. So the timing could be more perfect. Um, I'd love to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, I don't know if anybody's got a question, they can certainly put it in the chat in the chat box. Uh, the first question um, was how, how are they monitoring adherence to their restrictive diet? What's the adherence rate? Uh, oh, okay. For... So we monitor adherence with weighed, uh, weighed food records uh, or depending on the study, 24 hour recalls. Uh, and so we've had, uh, it's based on uh, achieving those goals uh, two out of the three days. Uh, and we actually had great adherence. Uh, I think it was 79% uh, and 75% between those two diets. So mm -hmm. uh, that is a really important question. Uh, and the gold standard is using 24-hour dietary recalls to monitor adherence. Mm -hmm. um the the um, other question I had before we're getting questions from the audience is: Can you describe a little bit about the mechanisms through which the food selection that you've chosen for MS patients works? How how do, how do we see someone moving from you know real neurological well, disability to fully or almost fully functional? So, uh, so on the um, walls paleo side, uh, we are removing. Uh, um, compounds that where you may have molecular mimicry that is driving an immune response uh, in the brain. Uh, we're also reducing uh, 
uh, dysfunctional microbiome uh, so we can decrease the excessive uh, cytokine production as a result. We're probably also decreasing translocation of the uh, uh, L LPS uh, across uh, mm -hmm. into the bloodstream. We are. We also collected um, uh, stool specimens, so we'll know what changes we had in the microbiome. Now, on the um, swank side, we actually improved the quality of the swank folks because we upped their vegetable uh, requirement as well, uh, and we also uh, uh, recommended whole grains. So we increased the fiber uh, there, and by reducing the processed foods, we reduced the trans fats. Uh, and the ratio between the omega-3, omega-6 fats, because we, we gave uh, fish oil in addition, we, we reduced fats overall, but I am guessing, and we're going to have to investigate this further than we do our nutritional intake, that the fat ratios, omega-3, omega-6 fats, and total cholesterol, may be fairly similar between the two diets. So... Um, mm -hmm. We'll, we'll know that when we do our uh, detailed nutritional analyses uh, in terms so you, of the dietary components. So you hit on something very important, which is the microbiome and its role in autoimmune disease and particularly MS. Um, can you share a little bit about some of the, the data that supports that? Because I think, you know, in traditional neurology, well, there really has been a focus on treating the gut as a way of treating the brain, although we know there's a tremendous gut-brain connection. Well, you know, absolutely. We have uh, Prevotella. Uh, appears to be an important uh, micro, uh, microbiome. Uh, uh, however, it is likely the community. It is likely, can that microbiome do all the biochemical pathways that you need to have your brain function well? Uh, mm. when, I, when I have my conversation with my microbiologist who's on our, on our team, mm. uh, he's less convinced that it's a specific species and more uh, interested in the community and the molecular processes that can be involved. So I, I think the studies that will be most definitive, Mark, are going to be the studies that look at the metabolomics uh, in the serum, in the urine, and in the stool that sees how the metabolites change. Um, so we, again, we have some preliminary data uh, from Metabolon that uh, and we, when we run our metabolites through them, you get a report back on 1,500 different compounds mm -hmm. uh, and all, all of the pathways that change. Um, so we, we see in our diets that we're, we're changing the microbial pathways considerably. Yeah, I think it's really clear that the, the diet is the biggest driver of changing the microbiome and that a Absolutely. Uh, phytonutrient-rich, polyphenol-rich, prebiotic and probiotic rich diet will actually help to reset the microbiome to an right. anti-inflammatory state and repair intestinal permeability that probably is leading to systemic inflammation that may be specifically targeting in these patients you know, MS, but can be you know widely targeted across autoimmune diseases. And, and there's really two components. There is all the, the great stuff that we add and all of the really harmful stuff that we remove. Uh, and so mm. the added sugars, the high glycemic index foods, uh, the um, uh, highly processed foods. And then when we remove the processed foods, we're also removing a lot of uh, food additives mm. that may be part of the mm. problem as well. So yeah. I think we have to think about the stuff that we add and the stuff that we remove. I and a reminder that there are probably many dietary patterns that are going to be helpful. I don't think it's going to be just swank and just walls. I think mm -hmm. there will probably be several plans, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually great news for our patients. So we can we can help them craft a plan that is culturally uh, uh, agreeable to them and their family. Okay, thank you. You know, uh, one of the questions that came up was around a ketogenic diet, which is what you touched on in your presentation, uh, and the benefits of that. Uh, your Walsh protocol diet is not ketogenic per se, but it's it's definitely much lower glycemic and higher fat. And, and the question is uh, from Lily is, you know, in these patients, sometimes there are complications such as cholelithiasis. Have you seen this? Uh, what other challenges have you seen with, with using a ketogenic diet in, in, in patients who have uh, well, MS for autoimmune diseases? Uh, the amount of data that we have on ketogenic diets in autoimmune is really very, 
I am reluctant to recommend that uh, clinically. Um, if the patient mm. has other reasons to be on a ketogenic diet, uh, then it's certainly worth it. If you decide diet, you are going to have to follow their lipids closely. And but make a decision, you know, do I do a medium change for this right diet? Or, um, uh, and if my lipids go up, then you're going to have to switch to a olive oil-based ketogenic diet. Uh, or you may have to abandon the ketogenic diet entirely. And and the other problem you have to think about, as you said, gallstones, uh, have they had a cholecystectomy? And uh, those would be reasons that I would, if either of those circumstances exist, um, I would be very reluctant to use a ketogenic diet. Mm. So many of these patients um, were likely on medication, uh, various types of immunosuppressive medication. Uh, how was that managed in this population as they got better? Did they stay on them? Did they get off them? And, and can you share a little bit about the experience around yeah. medication use? So in our clinical trials, we asked people to stay on their meds and work with their treating neurologist. In the trial that I showed you, uh, the folks who you know had this remarkable improvement, either in quality of life or their motor function, uh, to the person, they uh, took themselves off saying, stay on your drugs, stay on your drugs. And to a person, yeah, not, um, and they continue to do well. But again, I, I want to stay on their drugs, work with their neurologist, uh, and then ask for a tapering schedule if you're doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you abruptly mm -hmm. stop your drugs, that's an invitation to a severe rebound. Mm. But what you're saying, it, it, to be clear, is regardless of the advice of the doctor, they stop the medication and they uniformly did well without yeah, exacerbations. They, they did well. They did so, well. so you're saying. But, but, but of course, keep in mind, first group studying, Mark, were uh, in the progressive phase. So they, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to have a relapse, but they might have, mm -hmm. again, had uh, worsening of their disease. In that mm. group, uh, uh, the folks who elected to discontinue uh, did well. Okay, one, one last question. Uh, you know, one of the challenges with, with approaching conditions using functional medicine <coughs> me, is that, no, I don't have COVID, I just had dry cough. <laughs> um, uh, one of the, uh, everybody coughs and everything's have COVID. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, challenges with functional medicine is that it's not uh, a single intervention. It's a multimodal intervention addressing multiple Oh, yeah. uh, targets within a condition. And this is often criticized. Well, how do you know if it's the diet or the supplements or the medication or the group or the e stem? And, and how do you address that? And is there a way to determine what is the most impactful of those interventions or or is it just a package deal? Well, uh, my, you know, I was severely criticized when I first started doing research uh, because I did this multimodal uh, intervention. Uh, what, what is interesting now, Mark, when I look at the NIH, there's now, finally, much more interest in doing diet, meditation, exercise groups. Mm -hmm. and, and so finally, we're beginning to fund studies that are willing to do this uh, more complicated intervention, realizing when people have complex chronic disease, you want to support as many of these uh, abnormal physiologies as you can to nudge everything into a healthier state. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the question of which component becomes uh, uh, more useful. I uh, meet with my statisticians and they do uh, some heuristic nesting. I'll confess I don't understand uh, uh, all of that, but there are statistical ways of examining that question. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a real challenge because you know when you're talking about treating a single target for a drug, it's easy to sort of use a specific intervention against a specific pathway, but you know, functional medicine. Cheap. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's very cheap. So the and, amount and of intervention I have to do to get people to adhere to all of this stuff is, is more complicated. However, mm. if people experience symptom reduction doing all the stuff I ask them to do, then it so becomes different. much, much easier. Uh, the other thing that we've learned is um, you want to do groups. So by the addition of uh, group calls uh, where people ch share uh, their success, and their challenges, and here the peer-to-peer -peer conversation in those groups 
is uh, uh, really, uh, in, in our experience, the way to enact uh, behavior change. Yeah, I think your, your work underscores a really important principle to close, which is that uh, the science of creating health is different than the science of treating disease. And yes. what you're doing is creating conditions for health. And, yes. and often it requires multimodal interventions, diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, nutrient optimization, and so forth. And this is what functional medicine is about. And I think it's why it's more challenging to research, but it also is, is adhering to principles of biology, what I call the natural laws of biology. So I think your work is just really groundbreaking and it underscores the need for more funding and more research and hopefully uh, the NIH and well, others can get behind this because this is not uh, going to be funded by uh, mostly likely other than philanthropists or the NIH. So I, I just really applaud your work and grateful for it. Thank you so much, Terry, for your presentation. Um, we uh, will share this presentation on our Center for Functional Medicine website, uh, including Terry's slides. So you can just make sure you can find that on our, our internet and it's probably available also to, to the general population if you want to share this. Uh, and uh, we'll be having another grand rounds soon, uh, which should be quite interesting with uh, David Sorenda, who's a, a scientist uh, at Stanford looking at the immune fingerprint of, of uh, chronic disease and has, uh, through multiple high throughput analyses, determined a number of biomarkers, which are pretty unusual, but are highly correlated with with uh, systemic inflammation and inflammation. So I uh, hope you all stay tuned for that. Next time, we'll announce the date and send you all an email. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us today at the Center for Functional Medicine's Grand Rounds.